Hello, this video continues our collection of videos about typical mistakes in TOK essays. In the previous episode, we explained what constitutes a supporting examples in TOK and how sometimes it may look like an example is related to an area of knowledge when in fact it isn't. We used history as an, the area of knowledge to illustrate this. In this video, I will continue with the same logic, but this time I will focus on human sciences. More specifically, my example today will come from psychology. I will show you one good example and one bad example of using knowledge from psychology to support your arguments in a 2 -OK essay. So, remember the general principle of using supporting examples in TOK. -OK. They must be second-order examples, not first-order. This means that they should be examples of how knowledge is obtained in a particular area, but not this knowledge itself. They should be about knowledge, but not about the world. They should not be subject-specific. For instance, explaining a particular theory in economics or psychology or political science would not be appropriate, but if the focus is on how this theory was constructed or evaluated, then that's okay. There's a fine line here, I know, so let's look at some specific examples. Here is one of the prescribed essay titles from the November 2020 exam session. Too much of our knowledge revolves around ourselves, as if we are the most important thing in the universe. Why might this be problematic? I will leave this essay title on the screen for easy reference. Natasha is a student of psychology. On seeing the essay title, she immediately thought about the concept of egocentrism, more specifically cognitive egocentrism. This is something they studied in class. Cognitive egocentrism was discovered by Jean Piaget in his famous experiments with children. In one such experiment, Piaget had a 3D model of three mountains. He put the model on the table and sat at one side of the table, while a child sat at the other side. From their respective angles, Piaget and the child could see different details. For example, the child could see a couple of trees on the slope, a mountain goat and a small church. Piaget could see other details that the child could not see, such as some snow, a mountain river and, I don't know, a flag. The child was first given a chance to walk around the table and study the mountains from all sides, noting all the details. When the child was back in their seat, Piaget would ask them, what do you see? Obviously they would describe details that were within their visual field, such as the mountain goat, the trees and the small church. But then Piaget asked them, what do I see from where I'm sitting? Up until a certain age, children invariably described their own visual field again. They said, you see a mountain goat, you see some trees on the slope and a small church. They didn't realize Piaget had a different perspective. In her essay, Natasha describes Piaget experiments and explains that cognitive egocentrism is the phenomenon when a person is unable to understand another person's perspective. Overcoming cognitive egocentrism is an important milestone in cognitive development some children manage to do it earlier, some later, and in some people, elements of cognitive egocentrism remain even when they grow up. In psychological research, cognitive egocentrism has been shown to be linked to all sorts of nasty things, such as low empathy, low intelligence, even criminal behavior. This is why, says Natasha, coming back to the prescribed essay title, the fact that our knowledge revolves around ourselves is problematic. Natasha is very happy because she seems to have found an example from psychology that is related directly to the title. But she shouldn't be, because it's not a very appropriate example. It's subject specific. It's a good example for psychology, but not a good example for TOK. It is about behavior of people, but it is not about our knowledge of behavior of people. It is about what Piaget discovered, but not about how he discovered it. It is about the world, about the way people are, but it is not about our knowledge of the world, our knowledge of the way people are, which should be the focus of human sciences. Tatiana chose the same title. She also chose to write about psychology, but she chose a different approach with a focus on biological reductionism. Biological reductionism is the idea that complex psychological phenomena may be fully explained by their biological components. For example, claiming that love is a chemical reaction in the brain is biological reductionism. Another example of biological reductionism is the controversial field of sociobiology popularized by Edward Wilson in 1975. 
sociobiology strives to explain complex phenomena of human society, such as marriage, crime and government, by genetic inheritance and natural selection. Just like some animals, such as termites or bees, have elements of society, so do humans, and the claim is that human society is a phenomenon similar to other animal societies, only more advanced. It is common among students to criticize reductionism, saying that a reductionist theory is a bad theory. Indeed, there's a negative connotation associated with the word reductionism. It's almost synonymous to oversimplification. However, Tatiana decided to defend reductionism. One big advantage of reductionism, according to her, is that it places human beings in the larger context of evolution. If we're just a brain, although a highly evolved one, then we're not the most important thing in the universe. We're not separate in any way from our animal ancestors, and our brain is just one of a very long chain of upgrades in this grand evolutionary process. Theories that argue against reductionism claim that there are things in the human mind that cannot be explained biologically, and that we should explain them otherwise. For example, love is not only a chemical reaction, it's also a choice, free will. Society is a product of quote-unquote culture. This position sounds attractive. But the major difficulty that non-reductionists are facing is that they cannot explain where these non-biological phenomena come from. Why do humans have minds, consciousness, free will and culture? Do other animals have them? If they do, where in the evolutionary process do they start having them? Do dolphins have consciousness? Do bees have a culture? How about bacteria? In human scientists, uh, if human scientists believe that we are the most important thing in the universe, they will naturally assume that we humans have characteristics that nobody else has. But then they will find it difficult to explain how these characteristics appear. On the other hand, if we believe that humans are not unique, that they are nothing but a slightly more evolved brain, then it will be easier to see the connections to the rest of the biological world. Psychologists will collaborate with biologists and perhaps one day all pieces of this puzzle will come together. Can you feel the difference between these two examples? Natasha's example is about cognitive egocentrism, a characteristic of human thinking and behavior. It's about how people behave. It's not about our knowledge about how people behave. It's first order, not second order. It's about the world, not about our knowledge. Tatiana's example is about psychological theories and their assumptions. Some theories, such as sociobiology, assume that biological factors are sufficient for explaining all human behavior, some theories assume that they are not sufficient. Tatiana discussed the pros and cons of each of these approaches. Her example is about how scientists create theories about human thinking and behavior. But it is not about human thinking and behavior as such. It is a second order example. Tatiana's example is suitable for a TOK essay, whereas Natasha's not so much. To summarize, here is a list of common questions that are investigated in psychology, along with their non-subject-specific TOK versions. Psychology. Why do people behave the way they do? TOK. How can we know the reasons that people behave the way they do? How can we be sure that theories explaining human behavior are correct? Psychology. How do people make decisions? TOK. How can we know if models of decision-making in psychology are credible? Psychology. Does emotion influence how we make decisions? TOK. Do emotional factors play any role in the scientific investigation of human decision making? The line between psychology and TOK is very thin sometimes, barely visible. However, it's important to feel the difference to stay focused on knowledge concepts and stay away from subject-specific arguments. More videos are coming up about other areas of knowledge. Watch this space. Don't forget to check the links in the description. They will take you to Semantic Education's website with our new TOK textbook, lesson plans, blog, YouTube videos and more. Thank you for watching. See you next time.